But there was this line, it was like a wall that couldn't go past. Wow. And um, so I was, I was just standing there, and it seemed like forever, but it was only like, it was like 10 minutes or something. And I was knocking and knocking and knocking and waiting, because there was something that kept telling me, you need to wait. And I was like, well, I've gotten this far, and the dog hasn't attacked me. I might as well listen to the voice. <laughs> And so uh, finally this little elderly lady comes out and she has this look of shock on her face, amazement. She's like, um, you're the first person that hasn't called me ahead of time that hasn't been mauled by my dog. Wow. And I was just amazed by that, but I didn't really show it to her. I just kind of went ahead of my uh, canvas being the salesman that I am. Right. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I, I came with her on the Great Controversy, and I think it was Peace Above the Storm. And she ended up getting those books, and that was a real blessing for me. I, she probably got them because she knew that God's hand was on you. Yeah. That you were alive still at her <laughs> door. So is that when God became real to you? Yeah. During was, that time? I mean, I was like, wow, how, how, can, how can he keep dogs from me? And uh, just all this stuff was happening. And I was like, I mean, how, how else will I hear a voice in my head about go to this house? And, right. and so um, that, was, that was kind of a, a spiritual high, but it still wasn't. I still wasn't one over yet. I remember that when we met, you were telling me that you really got a lot of good stuff from Pastor Dan at Black Hills when you moved there with your folks. Yeah, um, during, like, in between that time, I was just crazy. I, I just Rebellious, wouldn't listen. arguing yeah. with, with your folks. Yeah, I wouldn't listen to <clears> them. And, but we moved to Black Hills, and it was like, Green Acres, you just <laughs> You're really out in the middle of nowhere, and um, first I didn't like it, but it started growing on me, and uh, then our neighbors, uh, Pastor Dan and Patsy and his two sons. They're amazing. Yeah, and uh, I became friends with their children, so um, during like Friday afternoons, he started having youth meetings. We'd go over there and sing out of the hymnal, and then we'd have Bible studies with the group, and it, it started to get me closer, but I didn't, it's like I didn't notice it yet. Right. And uh, so, um, basically, I started doing personal Bible studies with him. He invited me to do that, and I was... Amen. I started doing that, and then uh, I f eventually gave my heart to God and uh, was baptized. Yeah, July 29th, 2000. You know, and I and I think about like Jim when you were talking about your whole testimony too, is that God worked in your life, worked with you guys being married, and and that is incredible story but like I said we don't have time I'm sorry and then I was working on your son and that that still small voice is speaking to every single one of us, every single one of you, and now is um, leading you, Jonathan, um, to a closer walk with God. I know that there's questions um, um, today, and I would like to first start with Sam. Sam, do you have a question for um, Jim? Yes, Jim, you mentioned that the uh, Mennonite young lady was the one that uh, introduced you to Jesus. Right. Uh, Briefly, if you can tell us, uh, how did you become a Seventh Adventist Christian? Well, um, after I, I surrendered my life to the Lord w while I was living in Pennsylvania working at this processing plant, um, I moved back to Richmond, Virginia, where I was originally from. I got a job in a nursing home, and the nursing home was just a, actually walking distance from the sev local Seventh Day Adventist Church. And I worked in the kitchen, uh, washing pots and pans. And my supervisor... Did you wash my pots and pans? No. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> can such do that. an opportunity. After the show. All right. <laughs> and uh, so I, my supervisor at the nursing home was a seven-day Adventist, and she started sharing with me about uh, the Sabbath and, 
and some other things in the Bible. And she learned that I didn't, I was a new Christian and didn't have a church home. And uh, she invited me to church. Amen. And uh, I, one, as soon as I got my first uh, Sabbath off, you know, at work, because uh, people have to eat, you know, on the weekends too. And uh, so I started going to church and I knew from my first Sabbath in church that this is where God wanted me to be. So I just so kept going. So then started studying all those issues, eh? Right. I started I started going. I kept going to church, and I, one Sabbath, I just told the pastor, I said, "Well, when are you going to baptize me?" Okay. You know what I I, I love, and we we have. Um you know, less than a minute. But what I love about your whole um, story and listening to how God has led, it's all of heaven really took you on and adopted you. <laughs> you know, it says that we are adopted um, as into the family of God, that we are joint heirs with Christ. And for some of us, that means everything because we don't have a home. We don't have family. We've been put from place to place and you will no longer be put to uh, for another place. You are forever in this family. And I think, how cool is that? Awesome. Is, do, you have, we have, um, do you have anything else to say, just quickly? I just, uh, I'm, my only regret, regret is that I didn't get to know the Lord sooner, but I don't dwell on that. Right. I dwell on the fact that I have the Lord now. Amen. And He's awesome, and that He's bigger than any problem I have. I can let go of my past and live in the present, but look forward to the future. Amen. I love that. And you know, the, the, like you said, the regrets about not having God sooner. Somebody used to tell me that if, if one day, they said, one day, Sheree, you are going to look at your past and not regret any of it, not want to change any of it. And I thought, are they crazy? Are they absolutely crazy? Did you hear about my past? And now today, you know what? I wouldn't change anything because it really makes me who I am. I can sit in front of people that have hurts and have dysfunctions and have stuff that I know what they've been through. I know what they feel. I know the abandonment issues. And I know there's a God in heaven that says, I am bigger than that. And I will walk you every step of the way. And I promise you will be healed. And I love that. So I wouldn't change a thing. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Cherie Peters uses the book Coming of the Comforter as a guide for the second season of Celebrating Life and Recovery. Written by Leroy E. Froome, this 320-page book offers every sinner the knowledge that the Holy Spirit is available to all. 3ABN now offers this book to you for a suggested donation of only $13 postpaid within the U.S. Call 3ABN at 618-627-4651 or go online to 3ABN.org. The following program discusses sensitive issues related to addictive behavior. Parents are cautioned that some material may be too candid for younger children. I love the way God leads us. I love the way He speaks to us. I love the Holy Spirit and that still small voice that Jim um, sang about when, when He reassures us of our recovery, reassures us of His love um, for us, of His presence in our life. And I'm going to read my favorite text is Jeremiah 29, 11. Has from the very minute I got in recovery. When someone first read this to me, I wept like a baby because it says, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. And I'm thinking, nobody has plans for me. Nobody has thoughts of me. My mother didn't even want me. She tried to self-abort six different times. And it says right here that God, God has plans for me. He has thoughts of me. And it goes on to say that his plans for me are for peace and not for evil, to give me hope and a future. Oh, man, I love that. And verse 12 says, then you will call upon me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear you. I love that. And, you know, everybody here in this room, everybody here watching, I'm sure, has felt that sense when they've called upon God and he's heard them and spoke to them. On 13 is one of my favorite. And you got to hear this part because it says, then you will seek me inquire of me, require me as a vital necessity in your life and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you then. And I love the fact that God says, search for me, 
Um, expect me to speak to you. Expect for me to lead you because I have plans for you. I have a future for you. I have prayers for you. There's one more thing I want to read, and it says the measure of the Holy Spirit that we receive will be proportioned to the measure that we desire and the faith that we exercise for it. And Ellen White said that. It says, like, if I am not seeking God for that kind of recovery, if I'm not seeking God for that kind of healing, I won't find it. But if I seek, He will give me as much as I need in order to get in recovery. So I'm going to beg you, seek after God. And until then, remember, God is crazy about you and me too. See you next time.